and welcome to Good Game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. The plague has swept through the Good Game office this week, we're all a bit crook, but what a perfect excuse to sit down and talk about and play some games. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so build a pillow fort as we sniffle our way through Magicka 2. Is there honey in this? Victor, yeah, is it death again? They're up! No! no. no. <laughs> we also find out just how incredible the adventures of Van Helsing are in the incredible adventures of Van Helsing 3. The impossible booms are in a pocket realm of the ink. And how am I supposed to get there? First, you have to die. <laughs> and we buckle up for a first play of Dirt Rally. Caution right five into left three tight over crest. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? What are you doing? Back to one. No. Time, time for games. No. Stop it! I don't have any pants on over here! I'm serious! Damn it. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, Magicka, the story of a bunch of colourfully robed wizards who often did more harm than good. <laughs> it was an awkward, kind of buggy Diablo-style game that ended up being a bit of a surprise hit, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And now, four years later, with a new developer, Magicka 2 is here. It's on consoles as well, but we reviewed it on PC, and once again, chaos ensued. Yeah, eat rock! <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Oh. I'm gonna kite him this way, and you shoot his butt. Stop electricity! Stop it! <laughs> B-Y-Y-Y at Nick. <laughs> oh, no. sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's hilarious. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Magicka 2 is set in a mythical Norse-inspired realm called Midgard. The land has mostly been at peace thanks to the Wizard Wars, killing off most of these clumsy robed warriors. But a prophecy speaks of a child who will have great powers and bring prosperity to the people. But the prophecy also spoke of a shadow. So the few remaining wizards set out to find the prophecy child before she is claimed by evildoers. You and your buddies are armed once again with an arcane elemental magic. The essence of Magicka is centered around the tremendous joy in experimenting with various elemental combinations to see what the outcome will be. Yeah, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and there are loads of different ways to use the combinations too. Stone creates projectiles, for example. But combined with other elements, you can do things like create fiery bombs. Oh, sorry. Hex, <laughs> Hex. <laughs> like, what have I done? <laughs> or shield walls, or armor. It's like a bunch of kids just got magical powers. It's great. Combining death magic with almost any element will create a deadly laser. <laughs> Use lightning as your base and you'll get a conductive charge that'll bounce through multiple enemies. You've got to just... <laughs> You can use single elements to create things like a simple flamethrower, or ice to freeze enemies in place to buy yourself some time. But it's always more fun trying out multiple elements at once just to see what you get. Yeah, and the chaos of experimenting while in the middle of battle is quite stressful, isn't it? Yeah, there's just so much going on. <laughs> oh, I'm up. And you're trying to heal, get a shield up, remember combinations of things. Oops. What am I doing? They're close to each other. Bring me back, bring me back. It's a mess, but a glorious kind of mess. <laughs> you mucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you pooed it so <laughs> Yeah, when you jump into this with friends, you need to set aside a good 15 minutes of just mucking around to see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah. What does yes. right do? Oh, big flames. Yeah. Oh, okay, so Bajo, you just made a shield of what look like fire bombs. <laughs> ah! With nearly every offensive okay. spell, you can either self-cast to imbue your sword. So... Ah, yeah. There we go. Oh, nice move. Or do an AoE attack. Oh, yeah, 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 that's Nick, great. Like this. That's good stuff. Like this. Yes. Or make a shield. On top of using it as a regular attack, there are endless possibilities for every combination. It just makes your head spin. Yeah, and likewise, there are a few golden elemental rules to remember to save yourself from disaster as well. You're wet, so don't use lightning. For example, using the lightning element when your robes are wet, bad idea. Oh, I just didn't take my own advice and I electrocuted oh. myself. <laughs> Actually, when we were playing, just using lightning at all was generally bad. Oh, oh, oh. No, no, no. 
Casting a single fire on yourself will dry wet robes. Again, it's common sense, which is great. If you don't want to get wet or drown, you can freeze the ice and just walk across it. Yeah, but then if you use a fire attack while crossing the ice, well... Oh, oh no, that melted. Yep. Back. No, that you're gonna melt it. Yeah, I remember keeping a notepad and a pen beside me when I was playing the first Magicka to try and keep track of all the cool spell combinations I was learning. And, you know, I'd still recommend doing that now because it's so easy to forget all of your discoveries on the go. I see how it works. But I think it's now also a little easier to visually keep track of spells with the way they've designed this new HUD. I agree with that, but the HUD also frustrated me. Often the screen fixes you in a certain area so you're locked in combat and can't run away. But then we'd get backed into a corner and half the action would be taking place behind the HUD, which was infuriating. Yeah, that was crazy annoying. I fell off so many ledges because of that. Oh, what is happening? Oh, no, I fell off the edge again! <laughs> it's the HUD, I can't see anything down there. You can turn off other players' HUDs, which is good, but there's got to be a simpler way to show that information. Yeah, or maybe just don't lock off the screen. <laughs> Another thing I was worried about with this sequel, especially since it's made by a different dev, was the game's signature brand of humour. In the first game, there were all these wonderfully nerdy references from things like Hitchhiker's Guide and Monty Python, but thankfully this is still very funny, isn't it? Yeah, in 2, there's lots of game references and silliness. It absolutely captures the spirit of the series' nerdy, self-referential humour. The jokes are maybe a little less niche... Social corner fun wall? ..but the whole thing is a much more polished experience. <laughs> so I think they've done well to retain its heart while still modernising the look and feel. Mm. There are a few additions that have fans of the series up in arms though, like the ability to perform quick casts of certain spells, like haste, revive, revive. Got it. Huh? something we like to call rain of fire. Careful. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry. I did not want to come back to life for this fiery storm of death. And a force push. <laughs> <laughs> no, you killed me. I love that force push so much. But yes, this is something that hasn't gone down that well with purists. But I think they've offset it by including a cooldown for quick cast and spells. And personally, I think the game is better for it. Waiting for someone to have a revive spell active is tough, but fair. Revive. I can't yet, I can't, I can't. Yeah, it would be great if we actually used some of those offensive spells against the enemies instead of each other, though, wouldn't it? Don't even. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> you got to charge it by holding the stick before yeah. you release it. Yeah, right. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> Floating in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Team one. <laughs> <laughs> there are some other changes to casting and movement, all designed to streamline play that I think work really well. And this game for me is still as chaotic as ever. Anything that makes this madness run a little smoother can only be a good thing in my book. On that, I'd recommend playing with a controller if you're playing on PC. I'd also recommend not playing the solo. It's tough. And it really is designed to be played with friends, isn't it? Yeah, death is frequent. And you really rely on the ability of your teammates to revive you. That said, once again, you may just want to find some better friends. <laughs> no! <laughs> oh! <laughs> the main adventure campaign rocks along nicely, with Vlad, the definitely not a vampire vampire, leading you through your journey. But there are also challenge modes to tackle if you're game. And lots of cool robes, skins and staves to unlock as well. Ooh. Like this beautiful platypus outfit. <laughs> oh, that's nice. What did you think of the sequel, Bajo? I liked it. It's a maddening mess of multiplayer fun that never takes itself too seriously. Oh, uh, they're all getting wet! Someone left no, it! Them. Oh, yeah! I do think this dev has played it pretty safe, though. Just streamlining and modernising aspects from the last game and not really adding anything new or different. Yeah, but I think that's OK for this sequel because there is such a noticeable jump in quality, and yet it strives to retain much of what people loved with the original. I think any future games in this series would definitely need to bring something fresher to the table, but I had a great time with this. I'm giving it three. Yeah, there really is nothing out there quite like this. <laughs> I'm giving it two and a half. I'm dead. Next, can you revive? Oh. Run, run. I'm frozen, I'm frozen. No, 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 no. 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 Oh. <laughs> Here's what's making headlines. Valve has finally implemented a refund policy on Steam. Users can now request a full refund on any game purchased, providing they do it within 14 days of purchase and have played it for less than two hours. 
Valve was currently embroiled in a local court case after the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission took the company to court last year for refusing refunds to Australians. But now gamers the world over can get their money back on any purchase from pre-orders, DLC and game bundles for any reason. However, Valve notes in their FAQ that if they believe a customer is abusing the refund policy to get free games, they may stop offering refunds. An unknown San Francisco woman has thrown out a rare Apple One computer, which was then sold to a private collector for over 250,000 Australian dollars. Only 200 Apple Ones were ever made, and each was built by hand by Steve Wozniak. Last year, one was sold at auction for over a million dollars. The recycling centre where the computer was dumped is currently trying to track the woman down to give her a 50% share of the sale. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. Dirt Rally Power slid its way into early access a few weeks ago, so we thought we'd give it a first play. Over the years, the Dirt series has drifted more and more into the land of Gymkhana, an extreme sports wankery. But this is a very welcome return to the pure roots of rally. I think pure is the right word for this. There's none of that career advisor nonsense where the guy's like, you know, sick corner, last race, nice one. And this is no frills rally racing. There's no rewinds, there's no driving lines. Just drive. Get ready to push the line. <laughs> no, there's no lines. Championships are the main bread and butter at the moment. Here you start off with enough money to buy one of the two oldest, cheapest cars and then get racing. Each championship is broken into three events and each of those has individual races or stages. The times you post in each stage add up to determine your overall position in the event. Then you're given points based on where you are placed in that event to determine your overall standing at the end of a championship. Simple-ish. Yeah, and I like that because it averages your performance out, so it becomes more about consistent driving. I will say, consistent driving is not my strong point, though. That's three long, 60. Especially with no rewind or racing line to help out, not to mention you're pretty much always right next to a cliff. Yeah, it's tough. You really have to pay attention to your navigator's calls, but he just shoots so much information at you sometimes, it's hard to keep track. And on the track. And all it takes is for you to miss hearing that hairpin warning and it's back to the starting line for you. Four half long bad chamber, 60. Races tend to go for about five minutes too, which might not sound like that long, but when you're racing on the edge of a cliff, it seems like an eternity. Oh, absolutely. It's stressful. <laughs> and if you screw up right at the end and have to restart the whole race, oh, it's devastating. But it really makes you own your mistakes. You might That's launch into narrow. the air and roll That's the car, but if you manage to get back on track, you just got to keep gunning it. I also like how there's no AI difficulty option for the championships. It just sets the challenge and is like, there, beat that. But at least you can set your own difficulty based on what assists you turn on or off. And you get a sweet rewards bonus when you make it harder for yourself. Outside of the championships, you can also set up quick custom races or tackle online events, which offer up daily, weekly and monthly challenges. There's also the option to join an online league and create your own online championships with your mates. And all of these add the extra pressure of only giving you one shot to post a time on each stage. There are no restarts. Yeah, everything is about placing a time on those leaderboards. So you'll never race against other cars, at least not yet. I really hope they do add some staggered racing though, or standard races. Otherwise, this is going to be a very niche experience. Yeah, like we said, that this is still an early access. There's a lot of stuff that isn't there yet. There isn't really any weather, although some tracks are wet or covered in snow. And right now there's a pretty limited selection of cars and tracks to choose from. Yes, but the Back to Basics approach is definitely the right way to go for this series, I think. It looks great, it plays great, and it's already one of the best rally games out there. find ourselves browsing online game stores on the hunt for sales or bargains or trying to track down that latest AAA or indie title. But every now and then I come across something like this. Tea Party Simulator? 
And the deeper I look, the weirder these games get. Most of them are strange, silly, or just plain bizarre, but people are actually playing them. I love reading the comments and the feedback that people have. And I guess I thought we could use this segment as a way to explore some of those more left of center games in the hopes of finding a unique experience that might actually be worth playing. We're gonna call it the unlucky dip. <laughs> Okay, so I took the liberty of pre-selecting some titles that sounded weird, and this week I have the inestimable joy of playing... Hatterful Boyfriend. Ah, I'm actually pretty excited about this one. This is apparently a, um, like a, a play on a Japanese dating sim, only it's got birds in it. So, let's give it a go. <laughs> I think one of the funniest things about choosing to play a game called Hatterful Boyfriend is finding that five people on your friends list already play it. Bajo. Upon loading up this romantic adventure, all signs do point to a dating game. It's pink, there are hearts everywhere, and there are pigeons? This is a pigeon dating sim. To be clear, you still play a human in the game. It's just that for some reason you're attending a high school populated by birds. And here is where you'll hopefully find love. The other thing I found really odd is that it gives you the option to display a human avatar next to the pigeon, so that you can imagine what they would look like if they were a person. But again, to be clear, they are not human. You are human, they are birds. The first half of the game is introducing all the characters. There's childhood friend Ryuta, a rock dove. Nanaki, your high school teacher, who is actually some sort of quail. The ever-fabulous Sakuya. Ah, oh, Sakuya. Fantail dove. His feathers would make any birdie proud. Hmm, I think I know who I've got my... Uh, wait, no, it's a bird! There's a whole bunch of other birds as well. Librarians, gym teachers, a finch riding a scooter in love with a budgie from their former motorcycle gang. The whole thing is really strange. I've never actually played a dating sim before, so I have no real point of reference, but I'm getting how the stories must play out based on this strange pigeon version. You basically make choices on who you want to spend time with, who you decide to get to know, and slowly they'll start to share more with you. I mean, it's mostly pretty boring stuff, like go to class, go home to your cave. Why, as the only human in the game, I have to live in a cave, I don't know, but I've stopped questioning this game's character choices. You even level up stats. But the romantic storyline that I ended up with was surprisingly poignant, and not at all what I was expecting after all of the fantail doves and motorcycle finches. Oh, now I'm going to the library. Is anybody here? <gasps> I gravitated towards a quiet morning dove by the name of Nageki. He was a loner and always in the library and kept to himself. You know, I thought he seems nice and maybe the other birds just haven't given him a chance. And maybe it's up to me to give him one. We had some really nice conversations together. He helped me with my schoolwork, but he would never go out with me when I invited him. Anyway, spoiler alert, so block your ears if you intend on actually playing this, but it turns out Nageki is a ghost bird trapped in the library and my love sets him free. What? I fell for Nageki, the quiet library pigeon who it turns out had been dead for years. But you know what they say, if you love something, you have to set it free. That was my love story. So, what have I learned from this experience? What inspired this romantic avian adventure, Hattable Boyfriend? Here's what I think. Dating sims, The Sims, Second Life, they all set out to, in one way or another, achieve an artificial recreation of a very human experience. And if a game can make you feel truly emotionally connected to an avatar that isn't real and is essentially just a bunch of pixels shoved together, does it really matter what we call it? If it's a pigeon or a rock or a chair? I mean, give it a personality and weave a storyline around it, they're all basically interchangeable. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a relationship to get over. <laughs> Nageki. <laughs> oh. Took you alive, see? 
I'll take him to the lair. Great idea. The Incredible Adventures of Van Helsing 3 is an isometric click em up from Neocore Games. For the last few years, they've been pumping out these Van Helsing games, which have mostly been well received. We've never covered a Van Helsing game before, so I was keen to see how these games play, Hex. Yeah, me too. It begins at, well, what feels like the third act of a big story. Van Helsing came to free the land of mad science, which sounds fun, but it's generally bad for others. The land of Borgovia is in political and civil turmoil. And an ally known as Prisoner 7, who had previously betrayed Van Helsing, seems to be behind the theft of scientific equipment. You eventually learn more about Prisoner 7 and his plan, but like you say, Hex, this really does feel like the third act of a big story. And I think there's a lot of assumed knowledge with the story and the lore, but also in the game mechanics as well. Yeah, it feels difficult to just jump into this story and it takes a long time before you're really comfortable with how everything works. The dialogue is interesting enough though. At first I thought the voice acting was just plain bad. My friend, and I thought you had banished me to the sorrowful pits of despair for reasons that I can't even... Don't get started with the theatrics. But then I realised this game isn't taking itself too seriously. <laughs> the gate is closed. So there goes my hope of meeting a charmingly evil creature. The faceless czar is not good enough for you as a villain. Well, it's hard to be charming without a face. There are six classes to choose from for Van Helsing, including the standard rogue, wizard and tank. We tried something new with the Philostogeneer. A scientist with a regenerating shield, a devastating flamethrower and slowing mines. But I spent most of my time with the Bounty Hunter. He's basically a sniper using timed long-range attacks, poison and frozen bullets and drones. Combat is very similar to Diablo and other games in this genre, but you can play the whole thing with a controller, which is fantastic. It's not that well implemented, but it's enough to get the job done. Hex have really warmed to playing these kinds of games with a controller now since Diablo 3 on console. It just feels really good. Although it did take me quite a while to get used to the cycle of abilities here before I was efficient at killing things. Part of the challenge is all of the abilities are pretty much available early on. So it's all up to you to work out how to use them all and manage your mana correctly. Yeah, the game needs proper tutorials and a better learning curve. Being the third game in the series, Bajo, I was expecting to jump right in and have a good time with this combat but it's overcomplicated in so many ways. One example is the combo system that you build up and release certain ability perks. And this can be customised in the deep ability trees. It's a cool idea, but a little hard to manage in the heat of combat. On top of extra abilities, there are many different layers of perks for each one. There are also reputation perks, a variety of gear types that complement certain playstyles, and also perks for your ghostly AI companion, Lady Katarina. On top of all that, there's heaps of gear to sort through all the time. I mean, this isn't a short game, Bajo, but it's nearly over by the time you actually get to grips with it all. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I still don't fully understand, especially the crafting back at your base. Bring me a hammer and a wrench and I'll fix anything. I couldn't even work out how to do half of it, so I just got frustrated and ended up buying all my new gear. Oh, no one understands me, no one! It's just a bit too deep for its own good, isn't it? Yeah, and that's a problem because all of the work that went into those mechanics is completely wasted if everyone can't make sense of it all. I mean, I'd say it's more fun to just drop the difficulty down and plod through, even though that means the drops won't be as good. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Unless you're playing in co-op, easy is just much more satisfying any way you look at it. I do love that you can automate so many of the systems in fiddly work, though. You can also set it so your companion picks up gold for you or different levels of gear. I love options like that. She's not that great in a fight though, she's just not offensive enough no matter which behavioural setting you choose for her. I found she always just stuck close to Van Helsing, even when he's attacking enemies. <laughs> I like her story though. Lady Katarina is a spirit that's bound to Van Helsing, and as you play her origin is revealed nicely and you learn more about what happened to her and her family. So you made a pact with my father to get away from here? Yes. He didn't trust me for obvious reasons, so he crafted the magical oath that binds me to your family, and that's all you need to know. Overall, the combat is enjoyable. I never tired of slaying beasties right to the end of this game. It's full of random tough fights, AoEs that keep you on your toes and moving all the time, and interesting combinations of enemies to make you think about new ways to maximise damage and stay out of trouble. Great boss fights too, Hex. Yeah, it's super tough and always full of spawning pods and huge AoEs. 
Each zone is really fun to explore with lots of little side quests to pick up, and I was surprised at how many choices you got to make in all of these little missions. Not earth shattering, game changing choice consequence stuff, but just enough to make them feel more than just filler. I'm giving you a cut from the operation 20,000 gold, if you let us stay. Trying to blackmail Van Helsing in his own lair. A grave mistake. And the zones are beautiful too. Aren't they? And with thoughtful music to match. There's misty haunted forests, a creepy carnival, and later in the game some beautiful broken lands that go off far into the distance. There are a handful of moments where you can't really see your path and do a bit of backtracking, but they're barely worth mentioning. There's nice production values in the art of this game world, and that somewhat makes up for the hideous HUD and the menus, which I absolutely hate. Yeah, the interface is a bit of a mess to navigate, isn't it? The menus work better with a mouse, but then arguably combat is more fun with a controller. Trying to select which ability you want to upgrade in your skills menu will slowly drive you insane. Leveling becomes a total chore, and it should be this exciting, rewarding experience. Yeah, it's a real pain point, isn't it? There's also this whole part of the game where you can send off generals to go and do missions for you, but after tabbing and clicking for ages, I, I just gave up because I couldn't work out how to select the right thing properly. Everything seems to be fine. There is co-op as well, but finding players is a little challenging. Yeah, I think I only had one person join my game the whole time, and all they did was stand there and just farm mats. <laughs> do something. I can't do that. There are other online modes besides co-op, but once again, finding players will be your main challenge. I did really like the death system. When you die, you can choose to respawn instantly for a bunch of gold. But if you're out of cash, it's back to base. It's not a huge penalty because money is pretty easy to come by, but it's just enough to give death some meaning. I mean, overall, there is a good game here. It's just hampered by some really rough edges and fiddly business. Now, I really wanted to recommend this, but I just got frustrated too much. Playing with gear and mucking about with stats should be fun, but it's not in this. It all just needs more polish, especially for the third game in the series, so I'm giving it two out of five stars. We're just so spoiled for games in this genre, Bajo. Yes, we are, but I still think this is worth your time if you're a fan of the genre. I know I'm not going to play through this game again, there's little incentive to do that. But I love this setting, and I quite happily carved through all of these mobs over a weekend. Or then maybe start with the first game in the series if you want a more complete story. I'm giving this 3 out of 5 stars, with extra points for the chimera in your base that poops loot. Ah! Are you the doll maker? I am he. I have journeyed many minutes to find you from just upstairs. Tell me, how do I break the curse of the doll? Oh, I'll tell you how to break the curse. But first, I must regale you with the story of the doll. Oh, really? Can't you just skip to the end? It all began 100 years ago when a fresh-faced young hopeful had dreams of hosting his own game show on the ABC. Wow, that's fascinating. Take my way downtown. But before he ever had a chance, he was struck down on level four by an eager production wow. assistant carrying too many tapes. I came across this poor young man, captured his spirit and placed it in the doll. Now he haunts all presenters at the ABC. Hang on a sec, so all I need to do is get this doll its own show? Easy. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. Shut up, creepy person. Bye. I'm afraid that unusual young man will never be able to guess the doll's game. This week... Well, back to my creepy stuff. It was the DOS point-and-click adventure Veil of Darkness from 1993. You played as an innocent cargo pilot who just happened to crash his plane in the wrong place at the wrong time. You were then stuck in a remote part of Romania, and your only way out was to defeat the local vampire and free the villagers. And it's our Name the Game this week because it features vampires, one of the many creatures that Van Helsing is trying to rid the world of in this week's The Incredible Adventures of Van Helsing 3. Next week on the show, along with recovering in front of the heater, we're going to take a look at the latest juggernaut from Blizzard, Heroes of the Storm. And if you'd like to see more from this week's Magicka 2, then you can check out Good Game Pocket on iView and YouTube, where Nick Boy learns to spell. <laughs> Prepare for nothing but flawless victory. Sorry. Just move on. Hang Just on. go on. Let me warm you up. Thank you. No! Re Goodbye! 
Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Andrew out. How come I get this like gross green Kermit blanket with it, holes in it and beautiful. brown stains on it and you get this lovely like moon blanket? Because it's fluffier and it's a man, it's man cold. There's no such worse. thing as a man cold. Colds just happen to people, whether you're a man or a woman. Then why do I feel so sick? Gender equality. Why do I feel so sick? I man? feel sick too. Yeah, but you're not man sick. <laughs>